All right, apologetics, not apologizing for the faith, but comes from the Greek word apologia. We're defending the faith. I want to start off then this evening with a question. The question is, why is there something rather than nothing? Why is there something rather than nothing? As Stephen Hawkins says, why does the universe go to the bother of existing? Now, I'm sure you think about this question very often. I can see that. <laughs> I mean, why does stuff exist? We all agree it exists, right? Stuff exists, but why does it exist? I mean, surely it's easier for something not to exist than to exist. Amen? I mean, it's much simpler to do nothing than to do something. You can ask my wife about that one. <laughs> All right? Ooh. There's no law that says something must exist. Physical necessity isn't a cause for the universe. How does mindless matter spring into existence out of nothing and then evolve to contemplate its own existence? The great philosopher Ludwig states, why is there something rather than nothing? Where did the universe come from? What is the beginning which stands behind all other beginnings? The reality that gives ground to all other realities. The very fact that we are here to ponder the question is already the greatest miracle, the greatest improbability. Unless theism is presupposed, all thought and action becomes absurd and without purpose, suspended over nothingness. Unless the infinite exists, the finite could never come to be. What sense does the painting make unless this paper on which it is drawn? God is the great truth. And we are his dream. There's a big elephant in the room. A big elephant in the room today. In contemporary scientific discovery, the problem of matter existing from nothing by no one and becoming alive is a huge elephant in the room. This question has preoccupied the minds of theologians, scientists, and philosophers for centuries. Philosopher Bede Rundle states, why is there something rather than nothing? Is philosophy's central and most perplexing question? There has to be something. So the question is, how do we fill that question mark in order to get our something? Well, Buddha decided that a wise man recognizing that the world is but an illusion does not act as if it is real, and so he escapes suffering. And so to the Buddhist, the answer is simple. The answer is nothing. <laughs> nothing plus nothing equals something. And so truthfully, therefore something equals nothing. Freedom from desire achieves a state of nirvana and lets you see the world for what it is, an illusion. Contemporary authors have decided that because there's a law like gravity, the universe can and will create itself from nothing. Stephen Hawking. Our friend Lawrence Krauss says, quantum gravity not only allows our universe and other universes to pop into existence out of nothing, but that quantum gravity actually appears to require nothing. For the physicist, gravity plus nothing equals something, which actually means that nothing equals something. Stephen Hawkins says, even if there is only one possible unified theory, it is just a set of rules and equations. What is it that breathes fire into the equations and makes a universe for them to even describe? The usual approach of constructing a mathematical model cannot answer the questions of why there should be a universe for the model to describe. Why does the universe go to the bother of existing? I love the quote by Aristotle, nothing is what rocks dream about. <laughs> the 17th century philosopher Gottfried Wilhelm von Leibniz, who discovered calculus about the same time as Isaac Newton, 
pondered this question. And he asked, why is this something rather than nothing? And he concluded that it was God who had, in fact, created something out of nothing. And uh, he teaches, as do the, the, the Bible, that God made everything out of sheer nothingness. And we call that creation ex nihilo, the Latin for out of nothing. So for Libets, God plus nothing equals something. Therefore, God equals something. So really, as we consider this, we really come down to two choices. All right? We've only got really two choices. Natural cause or intelligent cause. Professor John Lennox states, there's not many options. Essentially, we've just two. Either human intelligence ultimately owes its origin to mindless matter, or there is a creator. It's strange that some people claim it's that's their intelligence that leads them to prefer the first to the second. So natural cause. Really, it's saying that there's nothing outside of this impersonal universe. The universe is the box which contains everything, all material, everything is contained within this box. There is nothing outside of that box. The uh, supernatural intelligent cause says that something outside of this universe acted with purpose to bring about the universe and mankind. So it's really important as we consider these choices that both of these choices ultimately are based on assumptions. Because none of us were there when the universe was created. We have to make an assumption based on what we see and what we can work out. But ultimately, those assumptions are based on faith. The natural cause arguments fall into two main camps. The first camp really says that um, the universe existed eternally with no beginning or end. The other camp says the universe began at a specific point in time and will eventually come to an end. So the first theory then that concerns the universe has always existed is what we call the steady state universe. So it tells us that the expanding universe was in a steady state. There's a continuous creation of matter throughout the universe. The universe is infinite. It has no beginning. It has no end. However, since the mid-1960s, there's been a lot of scientific evidence to indicate that this theory is not correct. Uh, the next theory really concerns the oscillating universe, or the Big Bounce universe. And this particular model proposes that the universe is in a state of continuous expansion and contraction, a whole series of big bangs and big crunches. Uh, there's not enough mass in the universe to cause it to recollapse, even with adding dark matter. It violates the second law of thermodynamics. Uh, uh, essentially, the oscillation model, in fact, says that if you drop a ball, it'll just carry on bouncing forever. And we know that the, the laws of thermodynamics would not allow that. Um, um, uh, who or what wound it up in the first place and ordered the universe for its first expansion event? And that model actually is a brain collision model that actually teaches that our universe is a result of a collision of two three-dimensional worlds on a hidden fourth dimension. Well, when I start hearing about hidden fourth dimensions and, and so forth, it does get a bit hairy. Um, this particular model has been proposed by Paul Steinhardt of Princeton University. Uh, essentially, he says that our current universe um, arose from a collision of three-dimensional uh, brains uh, in, in a space with an extra fourth spatial dimension. It has uh, much tied in with string theory and so forth. Uh, essentially, it's, it, it, it's, it aligns itself with the, the Big Bang Theory that we're going to look at soon, but it starts off with a cold void rather than a hot explosion. The next one is the internal inflation multiverse, an infinite number of universes, a very popular theory. You'll see this spoken about by uh, a lot of people. Essentially, the multiple universe theory postulates the simultaneous existence of many, possibly infinitely many, parallel universes in which anything is almost theoretically possible. We have our beloved friend Richard Dawkins. He says, unbeknown to us, there may be other universes, all slightly different, so that it becomes more likely that in that, that in that number, a universe like ours might exist. Does anyone have a problem with unbeknown to us? Is that science? 
How about becomes more likely? Or maybe. You're starting to move from science into the realm of metaphysics when you start talking those sort of things. There's a couple of objections to the multiverse theory, and we'll go into this in, in detail in a separate course. No scientific evidence exists. It makes more assumptions than simply arguing for an intelligent designer. Occam's razor, I don't know if you're familiar with that. You may have heard it on the Big Bang Theory. They talk about Occam's razor. Simply states that generally the rule is that the simplest solution is the right one. And what we're saying here is that you're making so many assumptions to try and actually uh, make your jigsaw puzzle fit that it's easier just to postulate the existence of a designer. All right. Thirdly, it still requires a fine-tuned universe, production mechanism. Multiverses expand and still require a beginning. And string theory has calculated the probability of them occurring as 10 to the power 500. It commits the inverse gambler's fallacy. And so this whole idea of multiple universes really seeks to replace the appearance of design by the hand of chance. It seems if one throw of the dice is not enough to get the result you want, then you postulate many, many throws of the dice until you can get the result you want. It is the height of irrationality to postulate an infinite number of universes never causally connected with each other, merely to avoid the hypothesis of theism. It is far simpler to postulate one God than an infinite number of universes. Next theory, I'm trying to move through them as quick as I can, the Big Bang universe. And we're most familiar probably with the Big Bang theory. By far, the most popular theory today are of, for the creation of, of why there is something and not nothing. Um, it's, this theory was totally rejected by scientists initially. Uh, the reason for that is because when you have something beginning as a Big Bang, it requires a what? A cause. It's far easier to have an eternal universe or a steady state universe than something that had to begin at a definite point in time. And so, as, as Albert Einstein says on the Big Bang Theory, for every one billion particles of antimatter, there were one billion and one particles of matter. And when the mutual annihilation was complete, one billionth remained, and that's our present universe. And uh, we see here that Stephen Hawkins says that many people did not like the idea that time had a beginning at the Big Bang probably because it smacks of divine intervention. The Big Bang theory, is, um, theory basically says that nearly 14 billion years ago, there was nothing and nowhere. Then due to random fluctuation in a completely empty void, a universe exploded into existence, something the size of a subatomic particle inflated to an unimaginably huge size in a fraction of a second, driven apart by negative pressure vacuum energy. All right. There are a lot of problems with the Big Bang at the moment. Um, it's having problems. Uh, it predicts there should be a, no object larger than 20 billion years or larger than 150 million light years across. It's not the case. It predicts that large-scale universe should be smooth and homogeneous. It's not. It's clumpy. It requires the existence of 100 times more dark matter than visible matter. There's no evidence or observable evidence that dark matter even exists. Who's heard of dark matter and dark energy? doesn't even exist. We've never found it. We've never seen it. There's no proof for it at this stage of the game. It has many unanswered questions. What conditions existed before the Big Bang? Where did the energy and matter that caused the Big Bang come from? What triggered the Big Bang? And how and why did the universe expand? The problem is, is the Big Bang theory is the only one that we really, really have at the moment that is, that is scientifically viable. Uh, to abandon the theory would not be e easy, and few theories in science are ever left behind when there's no alternative in sight. So what are we left with? Well, they start getting pretty hairy now. We're talking about quantum gravity and virtual particles. Space-time could appear out of nothingness as a result of a quantum transition. Particles can appear out of nowhere without specific causation. The world of quantum mechanics routinely produces something out of nothing. Quantum gravity not only allows our universe and other universes to pop into existence out of nothing, that is without the agency of a divine being, but that quantum gravity actually appears to require nothing. One of the most amazing realizations of the 20th century was that quantum mechanics combined with relativity allows something to come from nothing. In fact, nothing is unstable. 
Religion and theology, and to some extent philosophy, have contributed almost to nothing to our fundamental understanding of the universe. Because questions such as what is something and what is nothing are really scientific questions, not philosophical ones. When we apply quantum mechanics to gravity, the truly remarkable thing is that even space itself can be created from nothing by quantum mechanical effects. Given our current understanding, it could be that even the laws of physics themselves are not immutable. They could have arisen spontaneously and be different in different universes. In that sense, even the laws of physics could be an accident. Everything we see is just a 1% bit of cosmic pollution in a universe dominated by dark matter and dark energy. You could get rid of all the things in the night sky, the stars, the galaxies, the planets, everything, and the universe would be largely the same. It's the biggest mystery in science to try and understand where the energy we see in the universe comes from. Science has made it possible that the universe didn't need God, that God is redundant. That's a dramatic concept. Now, science doesn't require there not to be a God, but as Steve Weinberg said, it makes it possible to have a universe without one. So that's an interesting little video there that I just uh, put together there. Uh, am I the only one that sees a problem with some of the statements that actually come out of these guys? Yeah. Space-time could appear out of nothingness as the result of a quantum transition. Particles can appear out of nowhere without specific causation. The world of quantum mechanics routinely produces something out of nothing. The world of quantum mechanics is something already. How is it producing something out of nothing? When you, the world of quantum mechanics has to exist in order to produce the something, right? We have a look at statements like quantum gravity not only allows our universe and other universes to pop into existence out of nothing, but that quantum gravity appears to require nothing. Quantum gravity allows the universe to pop into existence out of nothing. Does that mean quantum gravity is nothing? Quantum gravity is something, isn't it? So how did it pop into existence out of nothing? So we get these weird illogical statements coming out of these, these guys. There are different types of not anything that by chance work together to produce everything. New origin of the universe model pours water on the Big Bang Theory. I picked that up in the news the other day. Big Bang Theory abandoned new model of the universe. Cosmology ex successfully explains accelerated expansion of the universe without dark, with dark energy, without dark energy, but only if the universe has no beginning and no end. We can't have the universe having a beginning and an end. Goodbye, Big Bang. Hello, black hole. New theory of the universe's creation. The truth of the matter is, they don't know. We don't know. The only sure thing I can tell you that science is definitely certain about is that it wasn't God. All right? It could be aliens. It could be nothing. It could be quantum gravity. It could be nothing creating something out of nothing. But it could be an illusion and not real. But it's definitely not God. So we've had a look at some of the natural cause arguments. And really what I wanted to convey to you is there's quite a lot of them. Uh, and, and the trouble with a lot of them is that there's very little hard scientific evidence to back them up. And a lot of them are starting to move into the realm of metaphysics to try and justify the claim. And you get a lot of these confident documentaries and confident statements coming out of people like Lawrence that actually when you start to analyze them, I just waffle, all right? Some intelligent cause arguments. Arguments for creation by intelligence. Let's have a little look about creation, intelligent creation. The first one we come across is the argument from existence, the cosmological argument, and we're going to discuss that now. I'm going to go into it quickly for you. Next one is the argument from design, the theological argument, and I'm hoping to cover that today as well. The next one that we have is the argument from logic, the ontological argument, the argument from morality, the moral argument. There's the argument from history, the biblical argument, the argument from desire, the belief argument. So we want to have a quick look at the cosmological argument, the argument from existence, the argument from first cause, the argument from a prime mover. But the cosmological argument has been uh, very popular for a long time. It addresses the fact that stuff exists. Okay, It's here. And it requires an explanation for why it's here. All right? 
the cosmological argument attempts to prove the existence of God by logically showing that the universe must have a first cause, an uncaused first cause apart from itself. Uh, the cosmological argument then basically says the following. Firstly, it states that it's possible for something not to exist. Amen? But something does exist. It tells that, that something cannot cause itself to exist, as it must exist in order to do so. It says there cannot be an infinite number of causes for something to exist. It says, therefore, there must be an uncaused first cause of all things. This uncaused first cause must be all-powerful, all-knowing, and eternal. And lastly, this uncaused first cause is God. It simply says, whatever begins to exist has a cause. This is the first premise or the proposition of his argument. Whatever begins to exist has a cause. He then goes on to say that the universe began to exist. Therefore, the universe has a cause. Whatever begins to exist has a cause. Does that make sense? If I told you that uh, I don't have a mother or a father, you'd probably be a little skeptical because you probably realize that my birth required a cause. Everything that exists requires a cause. Things don't just pop into existence spontaneously. If things could exist without a cause, I would expect to be seeing on a fairly regular basis pink elephants popping into the room and uh, all sorts of strange creatures basically just coming into existence out of nothing all the time. Something cannot be the cause of itself. A thing cannot be ontologically prior to itself. To create yourself, you have to have existed prior to yourself. Self-creation fails as an explanation. It is analytically false. So are we happy with the fact that whatever begins to exist has a cause? Good. Well, if that's true, we know also that the universe began to exist. And we know it for two reasons. Contemporary science tells us that the universe began to exist. And philosophical arguments tell us that the universe began to exist. Contemporary science tell us that the second law of thermodynamics uh, is to do with entropy. Entropy basically says that anything left to itself in a closed system will tend toward entropy and disorder. Essentially what we're saying is that the universe is running down like a clock. The clock was wound up at the beginning and it's running down and it'll come to a place where it has run down completely and will no longer run. It's, we go from high energy to low energy. We go from order to disorder. It is the way of things. It is the way of the universe. It is the way of life. If you were to reverse that pattern, then you would automatically come to a point where it was at its highest energy and when it was at its most ordered. And so the law of entropy says that the universe, in order to be expanding, had to originally be contracted. In order for it to have energy that is running down, it effectively had to have a beginning. Essentially, uh, we, we, uh, I spoke about it in the last one for probably about 30 minutes, about galaxy seeds. We spoke about relativity. All of these things are scientific, contemporary scientific proof for the existence of the galaxy, uh, for the universe, the fact that it had a beginning. All right, in time. And uh, I, I spoke quite a lot about galaxy seas, about the Cove Explorer. I spoke about relativity, all of those things. Einstein's equation essentially shows that time is linked to matter and space. So that time would have had to begin at the same time as matter and space began. All right, so it has a beginning. There's a lot of stuff around that. Uh, philosophy says that the universe had a beginning. Famous painting there, the School of Athens, Plato and Aristotle debating uh, the, 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 the existence of the universe and how it came about. A, I spent a lot of time on this in the last course. I'm going to breeze through this quickly. A potential infinity means something that exists without an endpoint. Can you give me an example of what you would consider to be a potential infinity? Numbers. I love it. Yes, how about numbers? You can count from one to... Hey. Numbers? No problem with that? How about a circle? How about a piece of string? If I cut in half, and then I cut the half and a half, and I cut the other half, and I cut... I cut how, how, how. Yeah, yeah. But you can carry on cutting for... So those are all potential infinities. And we understand in everyday life that potential infinities can exist. What philosophy really is trying to get at, 
uh, and, and is pushed very strongly by William Lane Craig and others, is that you can have potential infinities, okay, like time, like subdivisions of something, like numbers, but you can't have an actual infinity, okay? Something can't actually be infinite in the real world. And so uh, potential infinities exist in concept, um, but actual infinities cannot exist in reality. Now, why am I saying all of this? Well, the reason that I'm saying this is that I'm trying to let you know that the universe has a beginning. If it didn't have a beginning, it would be an actual infinity. And we're saying that actual infinities can't exist. And you say, why can't an actual infinity exist? Well, it would result in what we call as a paradox. So what we're really saying in philosophy is that you, you cannot have an actual infinity, a universe that lasts forever, because it will result in a paradox. Now, we've all seen uh, movies like Looper, where we have these weird paradoxes where someone goes back in time to assassinate himself. Uh, or you go back in time to you know, kill somebody's mother so that they would never be born in that. The, what we're saying is that you cannot have an actual infinity or an actual paradox. And we talked extensively last time about the paradox of Hilbert's Hotel. But essentially you end up with a paradox where you have an, a, a hotel that has got an infinite number of rooms uh, that can accommodate an infinite number of guests and is always full but can still accommodate an infinite number of guests forever. The next thing that philosophy states is that if you had a beginningless universe, it means that present events couldn't exist. If a series of dominoes started falling, uh, uh, for, so I had a, a mile long length of dominoes, and Joe kicked the first one over outside, and I waited and I waited and I saw them coming in and I saw them rippling through and eventually falling down, no problem. I understand that there was a first cause. He kicked over the first domino. It knocked over the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, the fifth, until eventually I saw them fall here. But if I saw the dominoes falling over the mo as they were coming into the room, the moment I saw those dominoes falling over, I would know that those dominoes had a beginning. They could not have had an eternal beginning. Why? Because if they had an eternal beginning, they would never reach the room. So essentially what we're saying is that all events happening in the present have to be linked to a preceding event, okay? If there is no preceding event, i.e. eternity, the present could not happen. It would never reach you. Dominoes starting to fall in eternity will never reach me. Temporal regression. All right, so what we're saying thirdly then is that everything begins to exist. The universe began to exist. Thirdly, the universe has a cause. All right? And we're saying that this cause must be supernatural. We're saying the cause must be powerful. We're saying the cause must be eternal. It must be omnipresent. It must be timeless and changeless. It must be immaterial. It must be intelligent, supremely intelligent. And that is really a very quick synopsis of the cosmological argument. The universe... Everything that begins to exist has a cause. The universe began to exist. Science says so, and philosophy proves it has to be so, otherwise it would result in a paradox or a temporal regression. Secondly, uh, everything that begins to exist has a cause. The universe began to exist, and we've shown that from science and from philosophy. Therefore, the universe must have a cause. Now, if the universe has a cause, can you imagine what the cause would have to be like to create the universe. It would have to be supernatural because it couldn't be natural to create that. It would have to be incredibly powerful. It would have to be eternal. It would have to live outside time. It would have to be omnipresent, immaterial, intelligent, all of these things. And we call that what? God. All right. This argument is an argument from intelligence, an argument from design. We're saying that we believe that the universe was created by a designer, because in the universe we see design. Uh, the logic of the argument is pretty simple. It simply states this. Behind every design is a designer. The universe has a design. Therefore, the universe has a designer. Intuitively, recognize 
design. Do we not? When I talk about something being designed, we intuitively recognize the fact that if I were to tell you that uh, the, uh, the government built Uluru, you'd probably be saying, I don't think so. But if I told you that the government built Mount Rushmore, you'd probably be thinking, I can buy that. Why is that? It's no use me talking about an argument from design unless we actually understand a little bit about what design is. All right? What is design? Well, um, William Dembski proposed a concept called specified complexity in an attempt to really define what design is. So specified complexity really says the following. Specified complexity is displayed by any object or event that has an extremely low probability of occurring by chance and matches a discernible pattern. Specified means it's got a high degree of order and fits a pattern. Complex means it's got a low chance of occurring naturally. And I've added a third one to it of my own. I've added informative. Communicates a purpose external to itself. Let's have a quick look. We've got some rocks here. I reckon those are designed or not. What are we going to go with on this one? Well, let's go, let's go through the, the, the pattern. I've put the stick there as well. There's my stick. All right, what order? Is this got a high degree of order or not? So we would say order is low. How about complexity? We're talking about the chance of this occurring naturally. Would you say it's on a high chance of occurring laterally or a low chance probability? Well, it's got, a, it's got low complexity, meaning that it's got a high chance of occurring naturally or a low chance of, of being complex. And information, does it say anything? Does it communicate anything external to itself? No, it's just a lump of rocks, right? Okay, how about this one? Now that one definitely had to be created by people, right? I mean, it's got order. Would you agree? Yeah, definitely got some sort of order to it. How about uh, the, the, its complexity? What are the chances of it occurring naturally? All right. Probably occurred naturally. Information? No information. Doesn't really tell us anything. It's a lump of rocks balancing on each other. <laughs> All right. Well, how about this one? <laughs> High degree of order. High degree of complexity. Conveys information, definitely to us. So we can see that these are examples of of something that's been designed. There's three arguments for design. The information theory, which gives us design and purpose. The anthropic principle, which is the design and fine tuning. And the irreducible complexity, which is design and interdependency. We're going to have a quick look at the information theory, design and purpose. Information theory is the mathematical study of the coding of information in the form of sequences of symbols, impulses, etc and of how rapidly such information can be transmitted, for example, through computer circuits or telecommunication channels. This theory was developed by Claude E. Shannon to find fundamental limits on signal processing operations such as compressing data and on storing and communicating data. I want you to understand, first of all, that information requires intelligence to produce it. Data has never been seen to spontaneously arrange itself into order, complexity, and purpose. Data cannot become information and is acted upon. Here's some data. We just got a bunch of leaves. Data, right? If we add intelligence to that data, we get information. No problem with that? If I told you that that word at the end there, hope, happened without any type of intelligence, what would you say to me? You're dreaming. There's clearly intelligence at work there. So we understand that information, okay, that information there always requires intelligence to produce it. Fundamental concept. It's quite interesting that we are currently spending millions and millions of dollars on SETI. 
SETI has scanned the sky for 30 years and found zero bits of information. Search for extra extraterrestrial intelligence, SETI, all right? Um, I love the comment that's made there. It says, an intelligible communication via radio signal from some distant galaxy would be widely hailed as evidence of intelligent source. Why then doesn't the message sequence on the DNA molecule also constitute prima facie evidence for an intelligent source? After all, DNA information is not just analogous to a message sequence such as Morse code. It is such a message sequence. I always find it interesting that we're scanning the skies for millions of dollars to look for the slightest modulation on a carrier signal, to signal some type of intelligence. If we got dee 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 we'd all recognize that as a signal resulting from intelligence. If they would turn those telescopes inward and look at the DNA sequence within our own bodies and see the intricacy of the code there, and yet they would assume that there's no intelligence there. I just find that fascinating. American uh, philosopher William Dembski states, the great myth of modern evolutionary biology is that information can be gotten on the cheap without recourse to intelligence. Neither algorithms nor natural laws are capable of producing information. So firstly, we've seen that information requires intelligence to produce it. Secondly, I want you to understand that information requires intelligence to increase it. If I uh, said to you that there's an abacus there, we would understand that it required the presence of intelligence in order to produce a computer. Why then do we feel that we can go from molecules and atoms to man with no intelligence involved? For me, any increase in intelligence requires in, in information requires intelligence to increase it. All right? Thirdly, I want us to understand that information is not the source of intelligence. All right? It's really important to understand when we consider this information. All right? Um, if, I had to, if I had to write something on a whiteboard, how are you in a big black pen on a whiteboard? Okay? Where is the data? The data is, is the ink dots that are on the board. Okay? Where is the medium that the data is on or carrying the information? The whiteboard. All right? Where is the information? Where is the information? The information is in the order of the, of the data, into the shape of letters. Yes? All right. We're happy with that. Where is the intelligence? If I rub that whiteboard off, has the intelligence gone? The intelligence is residing where? In the author, the person who wrote that. So we need to understand that information is never the source of the intelligence, all right? It's just the medium that conveys the intelligence. So when you see information, you need to understand that the intelligence is outside. That's really important when we look at a DNA and we see information on the DNA to understand the DNA is not the intelligence. It's just the carrier. The intelligence is external to that. All right. I did a, a bit of a study on the mathematical theory of communication. This was put together by the University of Illinois. And uh, essentially, they put together a, a theory of communication, how communication works. And this is what one of the, uh, the diagrams that they actually have. Information source, a message going to a transmitter, a signal, noise. Stuff. This is their, their basic message. And what we actually did is we've actually mapped that over the communication model for a DNA. And you'll actually notice that they actually map each other almost perfectly, except the DNA's got quite a few more bits to it. DNA has all of the, all, all of the, the, the communication protocols that are required. Okay? Message, DNA to RNA, channels, genetic noise, uh, amino acids being converted into proteins, all of that is happening all right, in a DNA. So uh, uh, if I told you that the theory of communication required intelligence to occur, you would be quite happy to accept that. If I said that that same theory of communication is present in every DNA molecule in your body to a far greater extent, but that occurred by chance, I think that there's some problems with that one. All right. DNA 
It's an amazing, amazing thing, DNA. It's found inside every single cell in your body except your blood. Uh, humans have roughly um, that many trillion, 100 trillion cells in your body. It's in every one of the cells. Each cell contains roughly two meters of DNA in those 100 trillion cells. Two meters of DNA is coiled up in this. If you unraveled all of your DNA from all of your cells and laid out the DNA end to end, the strand would stretch from the earth to the sun 4,000 times. The sun's 98 million miles away. You could fit 25,000 strands of DNA side by side in the width of a single human hair. One gram of DNA contains 1.8 zettabytes of information. It's equal to all of the information in the world. That's a lot of information. Basically all the information in the world. There are approximately 3 billion chemical letters known as bases in the DNA code in every cell of your body. The four letters in the DNA alphabet, A, C, G, and T, are used to carry the instructions for making all organisms. So is DNA a sign of intelligence? The sequence of base pairs in DNA is a code. All codes we know of come from a mind. Therefore, DNA came from a mind. At first approximation, one can think of DNA as an instructional script, a software program sitting in the nucleus of the cell. Its coding language has four letters, two bits in computer terms. A particular instruction known as a gene is made up of hundreds or thousands of letters of code. And good old uh, Bill Gates says, DNA is like a computer program, but far, far more advanced than any software we've ever created. Former atheist Anthony Flew states, when I think what I think the DNA material has done is that it has shown by the almost unbelievable complexity of the arrangements which are needed to produce life, that intelligence must have been involved in getting those extraordinary diverse elements to work together. It was DNA that actually caused Anthony Flew to actually renounce atheism. Uh, I love the comment from Professor John Lennox. Is it not to be wondered that our archaeologist immediately infers intelligent origin when faced with a few simple scratches, whereas some scientists, when faced with the 3.5 billion letter sequence of the human genome, inform us that it has to be explained solely in the terms of chance and necessity? There's some counter-arguments to information theory. The objection that DNA is not a code, it is a code by every universal definition. The objection that information is not real, the information in DNA is real because it produces real effects. The objection that information has no clear objective meaning, it does because the results of the message in DNA are objective and specific. The objection that random processes can create information, they can't. The objection that codes do occur naturally, they don't. The objection that the nature of the designer cannot be determined, it can. So that's my uh, quick presentation on information theory. And again, I covered a lot of this in the previous courses, which is why I'm scooting through it fairly quickly now. All right. So really what we're saying in information theory is that information requires data. And data to become information requires intelligence. If you look at the code in your DNA, it is information, it is a code that has required intelligence to produce it. For me, probably one of the strongest arguments for the existence of a creator. If you have to look at a DNA molecule, it is absolutely inconceivable that the code that required uh, on that DNA molecule arose purely by chance. Uh, we've talked about design proved by the existence of information. Okay? The anthropic principle really talks about fine-tuning in the universe. Uh, the universe exists by virtue of many fine-tuned physical constants. The precision of this fine-tuning is not due to necessity or chance. Therefore, the universe does not exist by necessity or chance. Uh, the anthropic principle basically says that uh, um, observations of the universe must be compatible uh, with the conscious and sapient life that observes it. And we're basically saying that science has shown that intelligent life could not exist in our universe 
apart from an extremely precise set of conditions that are unlikely to have occurred by chance. Let's have a quick look at these. Uh, I, I've got actually a video that's going to do it much better, so I'm not going to waste a lot of time. The physical constants must have existed at the birth of the universe. They're independent of the laws of nature. They must fall into an extremely narrow range of values. They must all be fine-tuned relative to each other. But I just want to point out two constants to you that are really important for us to be aware of. The first one is the gravitational constant. This gravitational constant is so, has a tolerance of 1 to 10 to the 40. I think in the video they may have even said 1 to 10 to the 60. Uh, this tolerance is an extremely fine tolerance, and, and I'll talk a little bit about it. But essentially, if you were to take a ruler with centimeters on it, and you were to take this ruler and you were to stretch it out across the entire width of the entire known universe, all right? from end to end, the tolerance for gravity would be one centimeter on either side of that entire ruler for it to actually, that's the, sort of, that's the sort of ratio we're talking about. Anything out of that tolerance, the universe couldn't exist. All right, it, it, would, have, it would never have existed. All right, if we have a look at the cosmological constant, if you think that 10 to the 40 is fine, the cosmological constant has a ratio of 10 to the 120. All right, that's pretty phenomenal uh, when, you, when, you, when you start actually having a look at, at, at some of the figures that are involved there. From galaxies and stars, down to atoms and subatomic particles, the very structure of our universe is determined by these numbers. These are the fundamental constants and quantities of the universe. Scientists have come to the shocking realization that each of these numbers has been carefully dialed to an astonishingly precise value, a value that falls within an exceedingly narrow, life-permitting range. If any one of these numbers were altered by even a hair's breadth, no physical, interactive life of any kind could exist anywhere. There'd be no stars, no life, no planets, no chemistry. Consider gravity, for example. The force of gravity is determined by the gravitational constant. If this constant varied by just one in 10 to the 60th parts, none of us would exist. To understand how exceedingly narrow this life-permitting range is, imagine a dial divided into 10 to the 60th increments. To get a handle on how many tiny points on the dial this is, compare it to the number of cells in your body or the number of seconds that have ticked by since time began. If the gravitational constant had been out of tune by just one of these infinitesimally small increments, the universe would either have expanded and thinned out so rapidly that no stars could form and life couldn't exist, or it would have collapsed back on itself with the same result. No stars, no planets, and no life. Or consider the expansion rate of the universe. This is driven by the cosmological constant, a change in its value by a mere one part in 10 to the 120th parts would cause the universe to expand too rapidly or too slowly. In either case, the universe would, again, be life prohibiting. Or another example of fine tuning. If the mass and energy of the early universe were not evenly distributed to an incomprehensible precision of one part in 10 to the 10 to the 123rd, the universe would be hostile to life of any kind. The fact is, our universe permits physical, interactive life only because these, and many other numbers, have been independently and exquisitely balanced on a razor's edge. Wherever physicists look, they see examples of fine-tuning. The remarkable fact is that the values of these numbers seem to have been very finely adjusted to make possible the development of life. If anyone claims not to be surprised by the special features that the universe has, he's hiding his head in the sand. These special features are surprising and unlikely. Right, probably said it far better than I could. So uh, we've seen just uh, a number of examples there um, of uh, the expansion of the universe. Uh, one second after the Big Bang had been smaller by even one part in 100,000 million million, the universe would have recollapsed, Stephen Hawkins. 
A common sense interpretation of the facts suggests that a super intellect has monkeyed with the physics, as well as with the chemistry and the biology, and that there are no blind forces worth speaking about in nature. The numbers one calculates from the facts seem to me to be so overwhelming as to put this conclusion almost beyond question. Is that we've really looked at two arguments for the existence of God. We looked at the cosmological argument that says that anything that begins to exist must have a cause. Things don't just exist spontaneously, otherwise we'd see pink elephants popping into existence all the time. Anything that begins to exist must have a cause. The law of causality states that. The universe began to exist. We know that. Science tells us that. And I proved to you, I tried to prove to you, that the universe, in order to have a present, could not have had an eternal past. Otherwise, the present couldn't exist. The dominoes and the paradox. Therefore, the universe must have a cause. In order for the universe to have a cause, what would that cause be like? It would have to live outside the universe. In other words, it would have to be outside of time and space. It would have to be immensely powerful to create a universe. It would have to be immensely intelligent to create the order in the universe. It would have to have all of the attributes that we ascribe to an intelligent designer, namely God. And then we looked very quickly at the teleological argument that says basically that, the, that everything that has a design requires a designer. All right? And we had a look at three quick aspects, or two quick aspects of design. We saw that information requires, the design of information requires intelligence to produce. Information or data can't become information without intelligence. And we saw information on the DNA. And secondly, we saw the theological argument around uh, fine tuning. If you were to look at the cosmological constants in the universe, they are incredibly fine tuned. It would be like trying to tune uh, a 26 string guitar all at the same time with every single string uh, uh, perfectly tuned to each other and that, but, but somehow that if you change the constant on one, it would change all the other strings at the same time. Uh, the, the degree of, of fine tuning uh, within the universe is, as, as these guys are saying, so fine that it is impossible to conceive that it could have happened by chance. What do the atheists say? They're not stupid people. What is the answer that an atheist would give when presented with these sort of facts? Well, the most common one is what? Oh, there are thousands upon hundreds upon trillions of universes being created all the time. We just happen to be in one of the universes where all the cosmological constants came into place. Okay? Again, we talk about the inverse gambler's fallacy. You, there's no proof that there are hundreds of thousands of other universes. We would never know whether there were hundreds of thousands of other universes. That's not science. That's metaphysics. All right? And so uh, the reality is, is we live in a real universe that has real cosmological constants, and it is a very strong, the easiest uh, conclusion to arrive at is that we see design in the universe, in the information, in the, constant, in the cosmological constants, therefore, the most easy conclusion is that, straightforward conclusion is that there is a designer. All right. I'm not going to talk about it this week because it's going to be covered, but the last aspect of design that I will cover with you is irreducible complexity, which is design and interdependency. So we've looked at design and information, design and fine-tuning, and this is design and interdependency, and we'll talk about that on another week.